Do you think that strength training needs to be separate from skill practice? Just a quick note. For example, I'm throwing a heavy baseball to get better at pitching. Oh, no, 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 not that. No. no. All right. Let's, let's, let's have a logical. Let's have a logical. Yes. Now, there is, yes. there is a role for overweight implements and throwing, but let's, can we just shove that to the side real quick? Grüß mit dran, Gregory von Lebestag hier. Guys, I just got off the conversation with Dan John, part number two. We're thinking about making this a regular session on this YouTube channel. I think you will value it just as much as I value it because it's a beautiful thing to be able, I, I feel so blessed to be able to pick the mind of such a great guy, a humble guy who's so knowledgeable in the field, who has so many good stories, so much great insight, knowledge and wisdom. It's, it's just beautiful and I want to have you guys take a part in this ride. So enjoy the conversation with Dan John, part number two. Have at it and have fun. Now Dan, I'm just, I just want to say um, it's, it's a true blessing to be able to speak to you, to talk to you. I've learned so much from our last conversation. Oh, thank you. Because the, beautif the beautiful thing about the editing process is you hear it over and over and over again. Truth. And what I took, I took so many things that I was already able to share with my clients. For example, the pirate maps, the idea of the pirate maps, where one thing leads to another. Then we talked about habit stacking. Another thing that we're now taking into a small seminar is the idea of the secret. And then telling folks that awesome story that you shared with us, with the guys that took the boy yeah. out in the woods, beat, beat the him hell up. Out of him. What's the secret, right? And then you mentioned something. You started accumulating those numbers, the steps, the veggie portions, the workouts, the hours of sleep, how many times you took your supplements, how many times you lifted. And all these numbers, when you accumulate them, they sound massive. And that's the powerful secret because I did this for me as well. And for me, it was like four workouts per week where now four uh, five months in that's about what is it uh 20 20 weeks so that's like 60 80 workouts uh, 80 workouts veggie portions i have two to three portions per day so that's like over what 400 and and the steps even you you come to about a million steps per month if you take 10,000 to 15,000 steps per month and my health app told me that i'm having 15,000 as an average right now yeah wow so that, that was so much that I took from the conversation. And what I also took from the conversation was the armor building complex. Oh, yeah. And that's as simple as can be. Yeah. That's so powerful. And about simple, uh, it's so great. I just read uh, when I was prepping for the podcast, I just read a post from Squat University where he said, Bruce Lee had this great quote where he said, I don't fear the guy who practiced 10,000 kicks once. I fear the guy who practiced one kick 10,000 times. Right. So the, the power of basics and the simple stuff, right? Yeah, we don't need to have a podcast because that's all I know. Everything you just said is all I know. Mm. Now. <laughs> the power of simplicity. And the key is yeah. to have the courage to do it. You know, you talk mm. to any, get a group of 114 year olds in a room and, you know, they'll all have very lofty, lofty goals. And almost universally in that room, they'll have about the same life in a school, in a school setting. They'll all, all mm -hmm. have about the same life edges, you know? Mm -hmm. 10 years later, look what happens. 40 years later, look what happens. Mm -hmm. Those same 14, 15 year olds, same basically usually ethnic, here in the States anyway, ethnic background, uh, 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 income background. Yeah. You, and what you'll find is the difference never was writing down the goal. The difference was the adherence to the process of getting the goal, to the process. Uh, fall in love with the steps. Fall, fall in love with the steps. No. Don't fall in love with the goal. That's Write the, that down, man. That's, that's money. Powerful. Yeah. No, seriously. That, yeah. Don't fall in love with the goal. Fall in love with the steps. Because mm. that's it right there. Yeah. Falling in love with the steps aka the process yeah i love this I, I, and one of my yeah it, did i give you my three 
overarching coaching principles last week? I don't think so. Let me we know. can start with that when you're ready, okay? Yeah, yeah, just, just go ahead. So, you know, people ask me all the time for, you know, 10 this, three that, seven, you know, seven ways to terrorize your triceps and all that crap, you know. And... <laughs> yeah, works great for YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And uh, one of the things, yeah, it does. It's funny. It, it makes yeah. for a good uh, internet article because there's no substance to it, really. Mm -hmm. and, but so when people ask me about coaching or my overriding philosophies, very often they're very simple things. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll give you both sets if you'd like, but for coaching, coaching. Now, for me, there's two things. There's cueing, and cueing is saying things like stay tall. Yeah. Go, 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 go. Chest go. up. Yeah. yeah. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Coaching is when you step back and you then talk to the athlete, you step back and then you look at the full year you step back and you look at the next 10 years. That's to me is what coaching is. It's not in the moment. It's the, it's the big picture stuff. And, and number one on my rules for coaching is embrace the obvious. It, don't just look for the obvious, embrace it, fall in love with the obvious runners, run throwers, throw jumpers, jump sprinters, sprint swimmers, swim bicyclists, bicycle uh, lovers, love. Mm. And when you get away from that, readers read, writers write. Mm. When people ask me about how I write so much, I I, I just want to say, writers write. Mm. I, I got I spent mm. two hours today, and I think I don't think maybe a sentence will survive the editing process from the two hours of work. But it didn't matter because mm. you know, when when you have a workout, sometimes it's only one rep that really makes a difference, you know. At a weightlifting meet, the last rep is the one, the last successful lift is the one you talk about. So embrace the obvious, embrace the obvious, embrace the obvious. You want to lose, you want to lose body fat. Okay, well, eat veggies, eat protein, drink water, get more sleep, go for a walk. Okay, I'm done. Well, I, I already knew that. Well, then do it. I like that. Yeah, I, I know it. Well, keep doing it then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, keep doing it uh, then. You yeah. know, hey, Gregory, I want to throw the discus far. What should I do? Well, throw the discus. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing that. Okay, good. All right. That's great. And I can help you now. But first and foremost, if you're going to be a shot putter, you got to throw the shot. Uh, I think you guys call it Kugelstosen, right? Uh, Kugelstosen. Yeah, genau. Yes, yes. Boom. Yeah, yeah. Günther, uh, Günther was the Swiss, I think the Swiss Olympianique. Werner Günther, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he Günther. Very good. Got, beat by, got yeah. beat by Mike Stulls. And I think probably one of the best shot put finals in Olympic history. I know people threw farther in 96, but I thought 92 was the most uh, story worthy. It was a great event. Uh, mm. Stulls throws three personal records in the Olympic final. Oh, come on. <laughs> That's, I mean, come on. It's still, I just, I look at that, that day. Okay, good. Uh, number two, <laughs> invest wisely in asymmetrical risks. So after the tragedy of 9-11, uh, the Olympics were going to be here in Salt Lake City. And because I'm an administrator, I had to go to all these emergency preparation meetings. And I, it was tough, man. You know, we were, you know, we just, we had just been under attack. Uh we were hosting a worldwide event and the terrorism color was high. It was, a, it, was, mm. it was, it was, and so I was going to all these events and I learned at these events about asymmetrical risks. And let me give me my example. So in my house and in every car I own and in every car my daughters own, there is a three day emergency kit for four people. They cost about $20. And in them is enough. I mean, it's not, it's not delicious, but there's enough food for three days, huh. enough water for three days, wow. an emergency blanket, a first aid kit, some basics of survival, uh, gloves, just, and then I, uh, and people say, well, are you worried about, I go, no, I'm not worried at all. But I'll tell you this, if my daughter is driving in, I live in a desert. So if my daughter right. is driving in these certain places and mm -hmm. breaks down, Okay, I doubt she'll be out in the desert by herself with my grandchildren for three days. But even if it's just three hours, that water and that food 
or maybe something else. They maybe they need the first aid kit. It's a twenty dollar investment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How much is that twenty dollars worth for my grandchildren if they're stuck in the desert out here? And remember, the Utah desert, we have movies. I don't know if you ever saw the movie 127 Hours. Yeah, the, the guy, guy who had to chop his arm off. Utah. That's where I live. Oof. All right. Mm. Okay. How much is it going to be worth if my grandchildren, at millions, billions of dollars, yeah, of everything course. I it's, own. It's, yeah, yeah. So that's an asymmetrical risk. Why, so why, I, why do you, uh, if I may interject, why asymmetrical? Why not wait, say me, it is a risk? Oh, no, because it's because it's really not that important until it becomes important. That's uh, why asymmetrical. Right. Yeah, it's mm. it, it's it, it, what well, it's not important until it becomes important. I, I yes. use I use American football examples, but I, I'll do my best to to make it a little bit more international. But as a discus thrower, we get three throws in the trials. Okay, if I foul my first one and I foul my second one. How much pressure am I now on to get not only a fair throw, but a good fair throw? Mm, so mm. I train my throwers in something I call one throw competitions, where we put a lot of pressure on them, but you only get one throw. And the idea behind that is if it does come down to one throw, and it does sometimes, instead of saying, oh, jeepers, what am I going to do? They at least have been there before. Now, truth is, I go to a meet, my first throw is good, my second throw is better, my third throw is, and then I get three more after that. I'm moving, I, life is great. I love everybody. Yeah. I'm the happiest boy on yeah. earth. But when I walk into the ring with two fouls under my belt, uh, I got a weightlifting meet this that Saturday. Well, if I miss my two openers, I got to take that same weight again a third time. Mm -hmm. Well, <sighs> mm -hmm. So the, yeah, the, the mental, the mental challenge is, yeah. Yes. So invest wisely in asymmetrical like risks. Really like when that. I watch the world cup and soccer, uh, soccer football, I'm always amazed when I see a team that doesn't look really ready for the shootout at the end. Now, I don't know how many world cup games end up in a shootout, but it happens. It happens. It happens. Of course it does. Yes. It's a rare tournament. Let's just say two or three times. Mm-hmm. I mean, World Cup, right? Mm -hmm. I World Cup that, every four years, yeah. Every four years. There's probably two or three shootouts, right? Mm, yep, maybe. Don't know the statistics, but one of the maybe one of the classics is, I think it was Italy versus Germany. I'm, I'm not sure in what year it was. But the, the funny thing is what I can tell you, and I'm not a soccer fan, but the yeah. tension, if you watch it, the tension takes up everybody in the room no matter who you're for, the tension is, you feel it, and you're like thousands of, of kilometers or miles away from these guys. So you can imagine what, what it feels like when these guys step up to the plate. So the first Women's World Cup was uh, won in a shootout. So here's my point. If, how important is the shootout at the Olympics, or at the World Cup? Well, it's really important. So I would practice, I would know, way in advance six eight weeks months mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. years ahead of time mm -hmm. who's going to be my first shooter who's going to be my second my yeah. third my fourth yeah. my fifth mm -hmm. after that the sixth the seventh the eighth the ninth and the tenth so when i've got the guys from six through ten i might have an assistant coach over there on the sidelines you know getting them to not watch the other shots but to get them emotionally prepared to strategize because they're going to be even more pressure yeah. the second group of five yeah. if it gets that far that time might never be rewarded as a head coach hmm. but when it does happen it's i have a slight point. edge over the coach who does most matter. yeah the most important it, it it does it's not important until it becomes important yeah, that's, it's that's, not important until it becomes important now uh i like that this is why i have i put such high like uh, going to the, uh, in two weeks, I, I go to the dentist three times a year because that's what my dentist recommends. So three times a year, I go to the dentist because dental hygiene isn't important until it's important. Getting a single cavity fixed early is about a 20 to 25 minute pain in the ass. Getting a root canal is oh. weeks and weeks of agony. Yes. 
Yes. It, it's fine. Floss, brush your teeth, go to the dentist three times a year, or easy, wait easy. and have that root canal. It, it's your choice. But good you coaches decide, yeah. in number three, number two, invest wisely in asymmetrical risk. Oh, number okay. three is the one we've already been talking about. And that is what I call respect the process. <laughs> Here's the thing, Gregory. Uh I, I don't want to be a jerk, but in my prime, if you and I would have gone against each other in the discus throw, uh, I would have beaten you. Okay. I'm, I'm not being a jerk. I'm just I'm being kind. Having said that, maybe I was born with more opportunities in the discus. Maybe I'm taller. Maybe I'm stronger, more fast twitchy. But that doesn't mean that you can't make yourself the best you can be. Mm-hmm. The results are the results. Yeah respect the process mm-hmm. you know you might have a listener who says i want to be mr olympia got bad news for you you're not going to make it yes now, yeah but mm-hmm. you can turn Definitely. yourself into the best body you can possibly have within mm-hmm. the limits you choose for yourself um you might say you want to be the, the the president of the united nations and that's great and lofty but honestly to be even in the united nations is pretty impressive too you follow my point mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. M- so you, you can't always dictate the results. You just simply can't. But you can, if you respect the process, you'll get as far as you can. I'm a yes. student of a system. It's, it's, it's on uh, YouTube now. And it was a great American speaker, but an of Earl Nightingale. And he had this gorgeous voice. I mean, this is Earl Nightingale reminding you. <laughs> he had this great mm-hmm. voice. Okay. You know? Na- Nightingale. Right. Nightingale. It's a bird. N- uh, you know the ah, song, yeah, yeah, Night- yeah, yeah, a yeah. Nightingale Got it. in London Town. Yes, Earl Nightingale, and he has a. It, the series yeah. is on YouTube now, and it's called "Lead the Field." And he talks about your goal should always to be in the top five percent of any profession you get into. And when I first heard this, I didn't agree with it, but now I look back, and this is going to sound gentle, listener. I don't mean to be full of myself. I don't. But what I'm about to say is true. I'm in the top 5% of everything I I aspire to be. Not that I have a low low ceiling. So I would say as a discus thrower, I can quantitatively say I'm in the top 5% of discus throwers of all time. There's no question about that, but we can just say it out loud, okay? Um, I would say as a strength coach, uh, you, uh, you would throw my name in the top. Now, if you have 10,000 strength coaches, I would like to think my name will be in the top 5% of that. Mm. Okay. Mm. I mean, I, you can argue, you can just say you're full of yourself, shut up. But if you're following my point, I strive to get myself into the 5%. Yeah. So that yeah. in every aspect of my life, I strive to be the best that I can be. Yes. And what to do that is I respect the process. I don't try to screw other people out of their mm. work. Mm -hmm. I don't try to illegally defeat you. I don't go out of my way to undermine you Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're a real jerk. Uh, And what happens is if you respect the process, not only do you become successful in that one little area of your life, you become successful in practically every area of your life. Yeah. I I, I really, uh, about these three goals that you mentioned, the 5%, I recently did, uh, it it was longer ago, I did a, just a statistic, I wanted to see where we are as a personal training business, revenue wise, worldwide, and we're in the top 1%. In 2019, I've generated a revenue that that is so out of this world, that I can't even imagine it was like, it, it, for me, it was like, wow, I've never seen so much money. And I'm so incredibly glad that uh, God didn't hand this money to me earlier because I would have been stupid with it. Yeah, well, so yeah. <laughs> so what, I, what I've learned is just about these three points, just applying them to my life. And then that's the reason why I probably ended up in the top 1%. I embraced the obvious. So I knew I always had, I had two goals in my life. One didn't work out. So I tried to focus on the second one. And that turned out to be, wow, that happened. But it was a huge process before it. But I always had the obvious in mind that 
I there is something, there is one place I want to go. I just have to find out. I don't want to be, I just want to go to work and hate the job and hate my life and hate what I do. I think I'm I'm here to do something. So, and the second thing, investing wisely, is as soon as, soon as I had the possibility to become self-employed, I knew I have to be very careful with the money. Very careful with the money. And not only the money, just very, being careful with the customers. You know, right now, the pandemic led to the fact that gyms had to be shut mm -hmm. and we were able to reopen we have a we have a personal training studio it's it's not where you just go in you do what you want it's always with the coach mm -hmm. so people came back and it was out of this question it, it was not even a question to tell them do you want to gift the time that we were closed do you want them added to your membership or do you want them not added to your membership to the duration to support us it was not even a question it was automatically for me that months we were closed it is 100 percent sure that you will get those months added to your membership this is not a question and i've heard a lot of gyms who were asking their their uh members do you want to support us and for me i was always like nobody has to support me i want to do a good job and the marketplace accepts my job and pays my wages if i'm good at it and if i'm bad at it i suck at it i have to close the door so be it i don't want people to to gift me stuff i want to work for my stuff so that's number two and number three i started reading i just checked my audible account i have read five days of books now in total i have spent immense amounts of time with online reading stuff writing stuff looking up stuff i've i'm talking to you i've talked to dennis i've talked to luca i've talked to steve i'm always open so because i follow these principles that's probably the reason why i see that i'm ending up at a place and like you said this has nothing to do with my talent i just i have an incredible work ethic i'm just hungry and, and I have so much, I'm, I'm blessed. I live in Switzerland, one of the wealthiest countries on earth. So I have every right or every privilege to be successful because the groundwork's already been done. So there's so much I can do. And my father was an immigrant. So he came here, put in the work. So I'm taking it from, from him, right? So I'm seeing so many, so much stuff that you can apply to life. So that's why you probably said, that's the reason why you will end up at the top no matter what you do but at the same time I like what you said I'm realistic I know I'll never be a basketball player I'm too small I'm not an athlete I don't have the athletes mindset I have the business and coaching and service mindset yeah. I'll never I probably people ask me this will you join a kettlebell competition I said no because that's not my goal it's not my goal to fix my eyes on one trophy or process. My goal is to fix my eyes on the process of helping other people, spending life in a service. That's my, but that's totally fine if you're onto it. That's totally fine. But I'll never be there. I because, and I know it. Maybe I don't have, I'm not talented enough. That that could be it. I'm not tall enough. That could be it. I'm not strong enough. I'll never be a strong man. But that's totally fine. So I'm really, really getting these points. So and about, I haven't. Oh, go ahead. And about the writing, I, I had to write it down. Stephen King sa said something in his biography. I don't know if it was his biogra biography, but he said... The book is called On Writing. Yeah. And he said, you have, to, uh, you have to write. The first write is write with the doors closed. And the second edit, the editing process is write with the doors open. Yeah. I, I thought... Of all writing, the work he's ever yes. did, I... I thought that was his best book by far. Mm. It's the only book I, I listened to it on Audible and I had to pull over on the side of the road because I was so hit emotionally when he described the where he got the uh where he got the model for Carrie. It broke my heart. It broke my heart. Mm. It absolutely broke my heart. I even right now I'm having an emotional response to it. That's good writing, man. Good, that, that's when you know you're a writer is when people have to pull over the side of the road on audible mm, right. and uh yeah so let me, you uh, know I, oh, I i i just i'm not sure if i finished the book entirely the one thing that stuck with me is carrie does that come in the later part, portion of the book 
If you remember, then I have to uh, keep wait, this on writing way. or uh... on writing on writing. It's not in yeah. there. Ugh. Boy, I, want, I hope it's not just on the audible. I know Stephen King, when he reads his books, will often add things. But uh, OK, OK, but because I, one one thing that really hit me with on writing was the process, the process he had to go through until the guy called him up and said, congratulations, you're now I, uh, you'll be owed two hundred thousand dollars or something like this when he when he achieved that one of his books got signed with a big deal. Yeah. And and I I thought about it how the process how he didn't stop, how how he kept kept yeah it's improving it's it, when people ask us I think we talked about it last time, when people ask me well your swing looks so solid, I'm telling them well that's probably my one hundred thousandth rep, right and these are your first ten reps yeah, so yeah. it's normal. <laughs> So then, if I may, we we already start talking about some awesome stuff, but I just want to pivot a little bit into the strength side of things. So yeah. one of my biggest questions that I have, and I want to preface this shortly, is the question is, what's the best way to build strength? Would you say is it kettlebells or barbells? And just before you answer, when I'm listening to Mark Ripto from Starting Strength, I'm leaning towards the side that barbells are the best way to make you stronger. Well, Yet, don't when you get strong, but Gregory, it's an either or question and it has yeah, no merit. Yeah, keep going. Okay. It has no merit. Uh, the barbells are good for what barbells do, kettlebells are good for what kettlebells do, TRXs are good for what TRXs do, the ab wheel is good for what the ab wheel does. So, this is something I call the killer application. Um, the reason that we all have computers. We, I have more, I have more computer power in this room than the whole world probably had in 2005. That's how fast computers, the guys who flew to the moon the first time, those little, uh, you know, those little birthday cards that make that sing, you open them up and the birthday mm -hmm. card mm -hmm. says, then, birthday. yeah, they start singing. And that has and those things. birthday cards had more random access memory than the computers on board the, uh, shuttles that went to the moon. <laughs> so why did computers become yeah. so popular? Was this guy went to a board one day and he showed a friend of him. He said, so this is what I'm working on. Is there any financial value? And the guy said, well, you know, I hire 400 accountants to do what you just said you can do with the push of a button. Yeah, there's value. And that is called the spreadsheet. And the reason is, to be honest, a typewriter and a Xerox machine are for most people, just as good as a word pro processor. Uh, to be honest, letters for most people would be better than email for most people. Um, the spreadsheet is the killer application of computers. So what you got to do with every piece of equipment you have in the gym is say, what are the best exercises to do with this? Well, the kettlebell, it's the goblet squat, the most important exercise ever invented by me. The swing and probably the Turkish getup and those variations. With the barbell, I would say it would be the deadlift family and the press family. Mm -hmm. Now, you could also say squats too, and I wouldn't disagree with you. But for most people, you never really need to squat very heavy. So don't worry too much about it. I thought the TRX was the stupidest mm -hmm. thing I'd ever seen before. I got, they sent me some free ones with the DVD. I'm watching the DVD and they've got running in place and they've got all these lunges and all these push ups. I'm like, this is, this is, this is not something I'd ever use. And then we came to the T, the Y, the I, and the single arm row. And I pointed at the screen and I said, that, that's why you want a TRX or suspension trainer. The T, Y, I, single arm row. There's that little thing called the ab wheel, ab wheels. That is one of the few pieces of equipment that I, it is a perfect piece of equipment. It does something really good that no other piece of equipment does better. Uh, and then what you do is you just kind of fall down the road there and say, what is the best thing for every piece of equipment? So if you're an Olympic lifter, you got to have an Olympic bar. If you're a general, if you just want to get strong at home, you probably could go to a steel place and just tell a guy, I want a six foot bar uh, about, you know, this, about that thick around and then thicker on the ends. 
And then I want a bunch of odds and end plates that I can just sh stuff on there. And the, the steel maker would go, yeah, I got that for you. And spend the better part of an hour putting it together. And if you just want to train by yourself at home, you have a perfect training system. But if you want to compete, you got to step it up. No. And if you have big groups or if you're worried about progressive uh, resistance exercise and you want to keep better oh, better records, you're going to have to know what the, what the weights are, what the yeah. load is. Yeah, yeah. So never let yourself get in an idea that this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment is better. I'm no fan of machines, but if you're working with somebody who's been, who's 75 and just had a surgery, there's no better thing than a machine. Mm -hmm. uh, same 75 year old person, two years from now, uh, yeah. wants to compete with me in a Highland games. Those machines aren't good enough anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, anytime someone goes into a very narrow, this or that is better. The, the question is better than what? And, and, and you constantly have to keep going into, you know, a lot of the people you, you listen to online, read online, they are taking what work for them in a sport or even the sport of bodybuilding and then yeah. saying, this is good. Yeah. For this is yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. worked with seven people and I got them better. Yeah. So the other 7 billion people on the planet Earth should do what I say too. Yes. And yes. that's just, uh, it, well, there's a lack of intellectual integrity, obviously, but there's also just, it's just not the way the world works. No. Um, you know, I would love it if everybody Olympic lifted. And I'm sure you could bring in somebody else and they say, if everybody did yoga, somebody else would come in and say, if everybody, well, if everybody did kettlebells. Did yeah. Kettlebells. Somebody else yeah. would come in and say, yeah. if everybody yeah. did samba. Yeah. And the truth is they're all right. But mm. we we need a good coach has a very very big toolkit. You know, mm. I, I struggle when I when I listen to people tell me that. You know, the, one of the reasons I like Marty Gallagher so much is that you know he comes from Olympic lifting. He became a powerlifting coach, and then he became a body composition coach. Mm. And so the reason I like Marty is Marty is fluent in Olympic lifting. He's fluent in powerlifting. He's fluent in body composition. He knows how to tell people how to make weight for a contest. He knows how to get uh, middle-aged and elderly women to lean out in a very healthy, simple way. Mm -hmm. I like to listen to that kind of person versus, you know, uh, you know, I go to certain gyms in America and, and they'll brag about their success. And I'll look around. They don't have a single client over 29. Any jackass can train yeah. people from 18 to 28. Mm. I mean, if you want to look good, get a bunch of 25 yes. year olds who's never... Yes. The women never have kids. Uh, yeah. The men, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. nice if you know the, some of these guys are going to live at home and not even have to worry about bills. Well, of course you're going to have a good body if you live with your mom and dad, and you know, uh, and your whole life is the gym. You know, my whole life isn't the gym. Yes. Uh, you know, I wake up in the morning and I talk to my grandson, and you know, I, you know, I got to, I, I, you know, I got, I got to wear big point big boy pants you know I, yeah yeah <laughs> uh, it's yeah. different it's, it's completely different that's yeah and if, I, I see that as well and what that's what you uh what i see and i'd like to have just it just popped into my mind i think one of the critical problems of the gym industry i'm there are many but one of one of those is they started applying machine training or machines which are suited for like you said an elderly person who just had an accident or just wants to or a bodybuilder who's trying to get uh, here yeah. you go or a bodybuilder right who wants to isolate the chest to a bunch of right. flies on the machine that's great so they applied this ideology that came from arthur jones with nautilus and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and now they apply this okay when you know when clients walk into the gym and they say you know i'll work out in the gym i say yes you do a leg press probably leg extension leg curl lat pull down chest press then you do an ab crunch you do a rotational exercise in the back extension is that it about eight exercises oh that's it so everybody gets the same routine based in that ideology of a bodybuilding world mostly where it's like hey you're applying the wrong kind of system or just a one system to everybody so that that's like what i'm hearing from you as well and like you said where i want to really get your opinion maybe dig a little deeper because last time you said i think it is a problem is 
if people start taking the bodybuilding world trying to build strength you mentioned yeah, something last time you know in fact uh, you go, if you go to a highland games um highland games seems to uh, it, it's not so popular now but oh i don't know about eight or nine years ago at a highland games guys would show up and they'd be in their bodybuilding t-shirts and stuff and they thought because they had they look good in the mirror they could throw shit far and that just doesn't happen you know you you need the ability to do to apply force in a rotation is very, very difficult. And it needs a freakish kind of strength, which you're not going to get going for the pump or the burn. And I got nothing against going for the pump or the burn. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't carry over. And so to build strength, and I think I've proved this over and over, it, honestly, the only time I believe you should go for maxes anymore is if you sign up, you weigh in, there's three officials looking at you and you go for a max on the platform. Yeah. Um, and, and I say that now only because the more you, I doing a max in your friendly gym there in Geneva, Switzerland with all your bros and stuff, isn't the same as being in Zurich against Zurich with a bunch of people who don't like you. You're trying to lift it. That's a much stressful step back and you go to the European championships and most of the people you, you struggle to understand a lot of people when they talk to you, then step back again and go to the world where yeah. the entire world is watching. Yeah. Those are, those are all different mental states. And so to build strength, uh, I like to, I think of building strength the same way I teach people how to type, type on a typewriter or a computer, you know, at first you type a, uh, it's funny. I don't even know what the letters are anymore. Uh, F yeah A F G H J K L. Now why don't I know where the letters are anymore? Because oh. they're up here. They're in my nervous system. Uh -huh. I don't uh, ever... uh, habit. Yeah. Yeah. When I type the word, when I type the word the, I don't go T H E. I go. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yes. So type the word the. Yes. So people bum, bum, bum. have actually, I've actually had people watch me at work. I will talk and type at almost the same rate. So this is important. We go over this. I'll go, uh -huh, uh -huh. I like what you're saying there. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And I'll have typed it up. How did I get become a better typist? I'll tell you how I did it. I hired a guy. And every time I, I, I punched the letter F, he yelled in my ear, all you, bro. And then I just hit F as hard as I physically can until I got exhausted. And then he grabbed my finger and he pushed it harder onto the letter F until I, until I puked in a bucket and laid in a ball of sweat on the ground. On the ground. And then they took my picture and, and somebody said, Dan, John doing the, you know, the workout of the day, exhausted alphabet, you know, no, that's the stupidest thing I ever said in my life. It's funny. You get strong the same way. You you teach the nervous system what you want. You you get a lot of reps in. You lube up those reps. You get smoother and smoother and smoother. You think less and less. You know, when I throw the discus, the worst thing I can do is think. Because when you're throwing 10 to 15,000 times a year, all thinking does is get in the way. Um, yeah. I try to give my throwers something very definitive to do, like, I really try to tell them to slap the right foot into the ground at the start and really get a good feel of the concrete there. And the reason I'm just trying to get a good feel of the concrete is that makes monkey brain get the hell out of the way. While monkey brain is down on the ground, I'm going to let the nervous system kick in and throw the disc as far. And by the time monkey brain runs back up the leg and body and gets up through the neck and then back in to upset everybody, the discus is already in the sector. And then monkey great brain gets to go, what happened? What happened? Yay, 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 yay. <laughs> We're done. We got it. I like yay. That. And then monkey brain looks around and goes, that's me. I take credit for that. And we all go share a good point. Yeah. <laughs> so the best way to so get that's like, yeah. mm, is mm. to get used to the idea that you're going to do, you're going to pick the exercises you want to get strong in. You're going to do them and you're going to do them and never fail. Come back fresh and practice them and practice them and practice them. Uh, there is going to be an increase in load. You'll probably decrease repetitions at time. You might yeah. have really light days and really heavy days. Yeah. And pretty soon, if you have the courage to do that for a while, um, 
all of a sudden everybody in the gym will be freaked out when you walk in. I read a thing from Maffey Tone years ago, which I like a lot. First, you train the nervous system. Then the hormonal system steps up. And finally, the cardiovascular system steps in. Wow. And when I first read that, I didn't really understand it. I, di I didn't. It was I read that in 1987. And I didn't fully grasp it at the time. Not that I was stupid. It just sometimes it's like, first the nervous system. But it wasn't until I started thinking about typing that I started to really understand what the point is. First, we train everything to do what we want it to do. Then a certain amount of load or repetition or something uh, impacts the body. And the body says, okay, we got to step up. We need whatever's going on. We need thicker connective tissue. We yeah, probably yeah. need a little bit more muscle mass. Got to prepare um, for the next time. Yeah. And let's, let's accommodate and adapt a little bit. And after several adaptions and accommodations, um, the arteries and the veins and the circulatory system says, well, we got to keep up too. And then that's, and yeah, it is that, I, I didn't want to call, I was about to say effortless. Uh, it's not effortless because there's a ton of effort, but it's that, I hope you're following. Uh, it's that, you know, if you, just seriously, uh, try to teach playing the piano like personal trainers teach body composition. Sit next to a little kid doing their scales and yell at them in the ear <laughs> saying it's all you it's all you it's you got it you. you got it come got on it. one more one more one more set. hitting the wrong one. tone one more keep going it doesn't Everything matter falls you, apart doesn't, it matter. doesn't matter if you go in the right order uh it's, you know no, and then, no, just keep punching and, yeah. and the workout that shall not be named they talk about they have a phrase for you're allowed 20 percent bad reps hmm. well i've never been injured on a good rep ever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. every injury i have in the weight room is from a miss mm -hmm. so one fifth of the time you're accepting misses yeah that's great if you're a chiropractor or an orthopedic surgeon or if, a trauma nurse yeah. or an ambulance driver but the rest of us it is not really that. no no you know and and that's i just recently thought about one of our clients how we're doing uh she's in we have this package eight or 12 weeks where we help them lose weight and get them into shape sure She's been doing the press, the squats since day one, mm. and we didn't change it. It's pressing, it's squatting. We started with the swing about two weeks ago. Uh, we started just with the deadlift, just getting a feel. And now I see her, she's having a little trouble with the, with the swing, but I'm telling her, listen, we just keep going. We, yeah, you have sure. all the right, I love what Steve Carter said. He once told me, first there's information, then there's inspiration. So. Mm. You just, if you know all the right stuff, you just keep, keep punching, keep working, putting those reps in. And in her case, I didn't switch the system. Switch to another client. She's already kinesthetically gifted and she already understands we're doing already swings and clean and jerks and she's very safe. She's very strong. She gets to feel. And if we compare the two, it's like, listen, this is, it's just a different race. And this is where I got the, um, the idea of specificity, all right? It's. Yes, we have a template that we follow, but the specificity and the requirements of the client, it dictates how much of the template you can apply and how much you have to switch out. It's always, it's, it's legs and upper body. That's what we do. And if you work with kettlebells, it's good stuff. It's, it's, it's almost full body. And, and, and that's, that's, the, that's the basic premise. Comes back to doing the basics, doing them right, and then maybe we can go a little faster or choose a heavier weight, but just get those reps in. Back in 1998, when I first went online with my first blog, which is a while ago, wow. um, I met a group of women on this forum and I wish it still existed. It doesn't anymore, but they, uh, these were all women who lost, uh, it's a hundred pounds. So 45 kilos to get into this club, you had to lose 45 kilos. And uh, one of the things that was interesting, and I think this ties in, Gregory, to what you just said, is that the women all discussed weightlifting as being really important to lose 45 kilos. And they all agreed it's basically just two things. And, I'll, and there's actually two, there's two, two things. Press and squat or press and deadlift. Wow. 
the big upper body move, the big lower body move. And it didn't matter if it was squat or deadlift, which was interesting. And mm -hmm. back at the time, I don't think the women, I, well, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if, if all of them understood what they were saying just by the way they would talk about the movements. But we know that for body composition, if all you, you know, Pavel has that book, Power to the People, where he recommends just press and deadlift. And it's strange because, you know, you know, there, we have a famous American researcher by the name of Tom Fahey. And Tom and I talked about this one time and he said, yeah, well, he's got this great voice. Well, Dan, you know, he says to me, uh, if, if you could take a discus thrower and just have him press and deadlift, you know, maybe every six weeks do a variation, you know, go from bench press yeah, to incline yeah. to decline yeah, to yeah. military, yeah, yeah, go yeah. from rack deadlift to, yeah. uh, duck deadlift to snatch grip that whatever mm -hmm. he goes that's all you would probably need now having said that you'd be bored to death and you'd lose your athlete but if you have the courage to just do a press and the deadlift movement i don't know what well here's the thing uh, real quick point i don't believe in teaching people that there's 600 muscles mm. i believe mm. in teaching people that there's one muscle that's subdivided into 600 places. Now, I know that's just a matter of uh, linguistics, okay? I get that. I just played around, you know, if you've ever seen the great movie, Mystery Men, the guy just keeps, the philosopher just keeps flipping words around, you know, and it's, uh, but the truth is, if, you're, if your rack deadlift is 800, no, 400 kilos for five, and your bench press is, 200 kilos for five how many muscles are you working pretty much all of them i don't know if you've ever benched uh yeah. over 180 190 200 you know your calves are wide Every, awake it's it's everything <laughs> yet yeah. i you know yeah. my record was 110 kilos for my body weights and back when i was lifting really mm -hmm. really strong and my uh, deadlift PR is 170 kilos, uh, 170. Okay. So I knew from the start, I knew from the start, I'm not gifted at strength athletics yeah. because I have to work so incredibly hard to reach that, that goal or that number. And then once it's done, I was like, well, wow, that's it, right? So I wasn't, I didn't have to gift for strength athletics and I wasn't as focused on it, yet I do admire it, right? But I remember benching 110 kilos your whole body is in is in motion and your nervous system is like a christmas tree right so it's yeah <laughs> when i coach the the clean uh the clean uh the clean i tell people males anyway i tell males you're not going to understand the clean until you get over 90 kilos because up to even with 80 you could probably do a fast deadlift and a weird looking reverse curl and make the lift <laughs> i like that yeah. But when you get over 90, then you have to hinge and pop the weight up. So you're right. And, and so uh, when, you, when you do this workout, okay, so gentle listener, here's your workout for next Friday. I want you to do two sets of five in the rack deadlift with 400 kilos, and then two sets of five in the bench press with 200. Uh, and then the next day we'll lighten up. Is this okay with you? Uh, just do 350 for two sets of five and then 190 for two sets of five. Uh, call me if that's not enough work. Uh, of course, that's enough work. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like when people ask me, what muscles do the, sn and the snatch and the clean and jerk and the Olympic lifts build? I'm like, you can't be as stupid as you look. You know? <laughs> I mean, just, uh, I mean, snatching with a barbell is when, when I just recently looked at uh, Lu Xiaoyan, the Chinese, the Chinese dude. It's, it's, and he does this crazy thing where he cleans the weight, he got it in, he got it in the rack, yeah. and then he goes into the jerk and he goes down into a squat jerk, right? I know. Which is, wow. which is one of the I, Zach Thielander, He's a YouTuber, which I've learned a lot, a lot about weightlifting from this guy. And he said this is one of the most inefficient moves you can jerk a weight going down into a squat, but the way, uh, yeah, unless you're born to do it. Unless you're born to do it. Yes, he said it. He said this. And when you look at Lu Xiaoyan, I, I, I watched the interview where he said, listen, I used to think it was all, make it short, I used to think it was all about strength when I was younger until I understood 
it's about the technique. That's what you said when you when you have to uh, uh, clean clean the ninety kilos. It's it's technique, man. And and it's the same with snatching. Snatching a kettlebell at twenty four kilo for ten minutes. It's all about the technique, all about grip, all about the lean back, compensating for the weight, going to the backswing, extending your legs, uh, your knees, and, and, and that's what it is. And you said one thing that I want to really highlight because I heard a great strength coach said this. Um, you said it that if I would tell my athlete or client or whatever to do snatch and uh, deadlift and press for the rest of his season, he would be bored to death. I heard this strength coach that said, he was asked the question, what makes the difference between a good athlete and a great athlete? And I think he said, the great athletes are the guys who keep pushing through the boredom. Through the boredom. Wow. It is, uh, we have That's a phrase, powerful. we have a three word phrase, variety for fun. I like that. But okay, there's a follow up to this, Craig. Are you ready? All right, I'm listening. How do you spell fun? W I N. W I M. Win. Ah. I like that. So in American football, the stakes are so high with each and every game that you might have a fun training program and all the kids love it, but you're not going to be around next season because you're going to get fired if you don't win. So to me, so if you want to, I go to a track meet sometimes and my athletes, we have a very workmanlike attitude. My athletes will take it serious and I'll look at their competitors, you know, fooling around and stuff. And I'll say to them, guys, how do we spell fun? W-I-N. And then about halfway through the competition, those guys who are screwing around are getting so embarrassed by my throwers that they, they start to understand that mm. it's all, you know, if you're going to compete, you know, I, I'm sure if you're a mixed martial artist or a UFC guy, eh, uh, winning is uh, winning is good. Losing is not f u n fun. Mm -hmm. Not when you're getting you know choked out on uh, yeah. worldwide television. That's, yeah, that's what the UFC guys do on these MMA guys. What yeah. I, I recently had one. I watched one of these Luke Luke. I, I can't remember his name, but he was so cocky and so arrogant even after yeah. he lost. And I was like, listen, man, it's, it, you know, the embarrassment of 2021 is it's not once shown on television. It will be up on YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram, and it will be viewed millions of times. So your cockiness and the way you lost and how you tapped out, and maybe the guy hit you so hard that you started to do an alien move at, at the floor. So that makes you look so stupid. And then you should humble yourself, man. Get up and say, the guy beat me and he deserves it. That's, that's at least a thing. That's what uh, Mas, Masvidal said when he got beaten by that other guy. You know, I don't, I don't follow MMA as closely, but I like Masvidal. And he said, well, he beat me. Kudos to him. He was the stronger guy. That's it. It's done. And, you know, I, I, another question because it fits. Oh, okay. Since we're talking about basics, right? Mm. Um, I, I put my heart and faith and my belief system in, in the basics because they work so great, not only for, you know, athletes, the way I see it, but also with body recomposition or just that I'm seeing this one, yeah. one client, she's 52 years and she lost a substantial amount of weight already. And I know she's having trouble with the kinesthetic sense a little bit. So that's the reason why I know she has to do maybe two or 3,000 reps more than that other client who's kinesthetically gifted. But who cares? Everybody uh, runs their own race, right? So what's your opinion on functional training? See, when the word functional training came out, I wasn't exactly sure what they meant. And I've had a couple of coaches like explain to me, uh, functional training is one of those words, and I have to be careful. Let me, let me give a little phrase. Um, there's a, I think one of the great keys to being a good coach is called the art of the follow-up question. So because of my work in uh, religious studies and religious education at parties, people will often say to me, Hey, Dan, you know, you teach, you know, you're, you teach religious studies and you know, strength training too. And then they'll say, well, I'm very spiritual. And I used to just go, Oh yeah, me too. Yeah. I get that. Now I, it's called the art of the follow-up question. So I, now I go, 
what do you mean by spiritual? What does that mean? I look at my horoscope every week, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dan, you're coming from. Dan, you're a strength coach. Yes, I am. I work out all the time. So, so what do you do? Well, uh, I joined a gym. Oh, okay. Which gym is it? Uh, I don't remember. You don't remember? No. How often do you go? Oh, about six years ago, I went. Oh, oh okay. That kind of so, workout. <laughs> so I work out. Get it. So when I say I work out six days a week, I can tell you exactly what I do. When this person says they, so the art of the, what do you mean by functional? Now, the downside is that when it first came out, I don't know how this happened, but people thought it was jumping up and down and standing in one foot uh, using balance. And of course, you know, as a, you know, I believe that balance first comes from a base of strength. If, if you're strong, balance becomes easier. If your nervous system is, is working high speed, mm -hmm. balance is easy. Mm. Uh, but then guys like me, and I would put Mike Boyle in this category too, what we would say functional is, is that I look at your sport and I look at your goal set and I want to walk with you a little bit more. So I'm not going to do what you said, Gregory. I'm not going to just give you eight generic exercises to do, which has, which hey, leg extension, leg curl, leg press, lat pull down, press, yeah. horizontal press, uh, ab, back. Ab crunch, back That's extension. Not, you know, yeah. It's, it's, you know, that's not terrible. I mean, it's not yeah. the worst thing ever. Yeah. But if you're a, a sprinter, there's some issues. If you're a discus thrower, there's everything about it's an issue. So what we need to do, and I think in the functional fitness world is what we're trying to do is look at, look at what you want to achieve with your body and find appropriate, an appropriate toolkit to assist you. Having said that, the bigger and bigger and bigger you as a coach or trainer have your toolkit, the more naturally you become more of a functional coach. Um, got people who do kettlebell swings, barbell deadlifts, and go for walks are probably be real good about moving couches and chairs around a house. Now, none of that workout was tied into couch pickup, but you're just kind of better at it. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to be better at uh, any aspect of life, yeah. the the foundational push pull hinge squat loaded carry yeah. is going to yeah. be the best thing you can do. Um, eating veggies and protein and drinking water, getting a good night's sleep, those are going to be the best tools in your toolkit. <sighs> Jumping up and down and off Bosu balls is too stupid to even say out loud. Uh, so that's and and that's if I may just uh, interject because mm -hmm. I, I made a video about functional training and oh, I, okay. reacted, uh, I reacted to uh, a few kettlebell exercises that not only are not of a big value because it's jumping, light weights, rotation, hinging, it's everything at once mixed together like, okay. like these functional exercises stop. are, you know? Stop, stop, real quick. If you hinge and rotate ballistically, you'd better be on the field to play in your sport doing it. Mm. If you're in the weight room, you're too stupid to coach. Mm. And they, what, if I may just uh, sure. describe one of the exercises, the guy was doing two kettlebells, right? He was doing a, I don't even know why, who invented this, a ski swing, not using your hips, but swinging the kettlebells right by your side, right? Using yeah. your arms only. Outside, the outside one, yeah. I've yeah, which I, I like. think, I don't, I don't like it either. So he swings them back, then he swings them forward. And while he swings those kettlebells forward, he jumps and lands in a squat. And then he repeats that exercise. And it's just no value for most people. So I made that reaction. Then the guy who did the exercises reacted he commented then we had a small uh, conversation and uh i was basically like listen the problem with functional training is nobody can define it and that makes it really tricky for gurus and marketing guys to exploit it and use it in any kind of way and then he gave me a feedback well you know we're working with guys who have neurodegenerative disorders and we bring them back on on, on the field <laughs> or whatever and i said well that's great do you have any research to cite? Because I'm really interested, you know, if you have any feedback, some, some 
whatever you do. So we said, go to my page, right? So it was like, okay, you don't have a lot of research, a lot of evidence-based stuff. No, you just do what you do. Okay. So I thought, okay, um, you were degenerative disorders. Then he said, well, I'm working with athletes too. So I thought about this as well. And then I did another video. And so I did a lot of research. And what I came up with was athletes. If you look at what LeBron James does, one of the greatest basketball players ever Wouldn't compared to Michael Jordan. He's, he's still going to be better than anybody else. No matter, matter what he does. You, you, you can, I don't know, you can put a, a kettlebell on his head have him balance it, pick up one leg, and with his right arm, he's curling. Still and when he's still better than everybody else. Yeah. Same yeah. thing that I read about. That was a funny story how I, how, how I catched it because I was watching a documentary of Floyd Mayweather Jr. And so there came this great Netflix documentary about uh, uh, veganism, how strong oh, man is. Yeah. 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 Right? So uh, I, I can't even remember what it was called. I remember, yeah. And, and then I'm watching this documentary of Floyd Mayweather and his personal chef, she goes, he likes candy, he loves candy, he drinks Sprites, he drinks everything that the trainer tells him not to do, he eats everything that the trainer tells him not to eat, yet he's the best ever. So it's like, listen, if you're a gifted specimen out of these 7 billion people on the planet, you're better. probably you're done. And what these guys have, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, God rest his soul. And, and uh, Floyd Mayweather is a, an incredible work ethic. David Beckham, I read about David Beckham, how he stayed on the field and kept kicking those flanken. I can't remember the, the, the English word, you know, the, the pass from the, from, the, from the outside into the middle where somebody headbutts it into the, into the oh, goal. Uh, right? yeah, yeah, the uh, English word for flanke. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, sideline kick. Uh, the, sideline uh, kick, probably. Cor corner kick, corner kick. Not not the corner kick, not on the outside. But these, Just, these, when it goes like this, yeah, when he, yeah, when he yeah. runs and then boom, right? When so he, yeah. yeah, he practiced those alone on the field. So that means he kicked it, he had to pick it up, run back. He kicked it, had to pick it up, run back. Kobe Bryant, one of the great stories where one of his friends or one of the coaches said the guy called him up at four a.m. and says, "Where are you at?" Well, I'm in the gym. Why are you not showing up? So this crazy work ethic that even Floyd Mayweather displays. So that's athletes are a different breed, breed. Then I called up one of the physiotherapists in our local area and I called him, I said, listen, you have to teach me or tell me, what do you do for rehabilitating a client? Then he said, you know, the first thing that I do is ask what this client wants to do. It, does, it, if she wants to walk and, and go on a, on a trip, then there's something else. If she just wants to walk down the stairs and pick up her mail in the, in the box, that's another thing. So then let's say a 70 year old woman with a hip replacement, what we do is we have a lay on the back and then just make leg raises. Yeah. And then once we advance from there, maybe she just stands on one leg. And then I said, wow, so the resistance this woman needs is so small to build strength and muscle that it's hard to imagine for us guys who are active and healthy. He said exactly that. And then I said, would you do a crazy exercise with what I described him, what I described to you? And he said, not in, never. It's incredibly dangerous. So that's why I wanted to know. Functional, sitting down, standing up. If you have throwers, you know what these guys need. And that leads me to a final question that I want to ask you, Dan, is do you think that strength training needs to be separate from skill practice? Just a quick note. For example, I'm throwing a heavy baseball to get better at pitching. Oh no 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 not that no. no. All right. Let's 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 have a logical let's have a lo yes. Now there is yes. there is a role for overweight implements and throwing, but let's can we just shove that to the side real quick? So there's basically two ways I think it works best. Uh, number one is the more classic way, where either you you do your sport and then after the sport you go into the weight room and lift. Other option, you lift weights and then you go do your sport. Uh, if you're really, really strong, I think it's a good idea to lift weights first. And then, cause you're leaving on this, ah, what you're trying to teach the body and do the extra work is your sport. Peter Sheen, the great uh, German coach that I really learned a lot from introduced me to something that I like a lot called mixed training. Hmm. And uh, my mixed training is much simpler than most people. When I go out on the discus ring, I bring a kettlebell with me. 
I'll do some standing throws. I'll do some goblet squats. I'll do some step and turns. I'll do some kettlebell swings. I'll do some, uh, what the Germans call seven, eight throws and six, seven throws. I'll do some uh, kettlebell snatches. Uh, I'll do full turns and every so often I'll do some clean and press. So to the outsider, you, you would have a hard time seeing where my technical work is and my strength work because they're seamless. Uh, I used to bring a weightlifting bar out and we would do snatches and overhead squats. The reason I bring a kettlebell out, it's just a lot easier to bring a kettlebell out on the field than a barbell and plates. And for anyone who doesn't understand that, you know, go grab a 140 kilo set and carry it out, you know, yeah. quarter mile onto a field and yeah. just see how that goes for you. <laughs> and don't forget after the workout, you have to carry it. Back. You got to take it back. Yeah. So that's step. So step one is the answer would be both. There's so there's value in separating lifting and throwing or uh, lifting in your sport in either direction and a, an intelligent combination works well. Now, having said that, when I work with throwers, one of the things I'm doing more and more of is I, I buy these lightly weighted balls and we do the, the motion with the weighted ball backwards. So a javelin thrower would throw the ball backwards into a wall. Oh, or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's weird at first to do it because it doesn't seem right. And it's because it doesn't seem right because and what we're doing here is we're trying to build up the brakes. Uh, you know, when you drive a car, you hit the brakes. Yeah. So what makes the implement go far is all the acceleration and then you have to stop it. Well, what we're trying to do is make sure that your, your system has accelerators and brakes that are in some kind of harmony, not perfect. Uh, for one, one other thing we also do. Uh, if you're a right-handed thrower, we do a lot with the left hand. And really, this is going to be weird. It's not to build strength. It's actually to build up the number of synapses. Because if I'm throwing the discus with the wrong hand, I learn the discus much faster with my l- wrong hand than I did with my right way in the beginning. And when I go back to my normal way of throwing, I'll, I'll look over you at Gregory and I'll say, I forgot how easy this was. Because that's so, so don't forget, I spend a lot of time trying to make the nervous system as efficient as possible. I like that. And it's great to have a big engine. And I think having a big engine is wonderful. And I think having a big engine, being really strong, having a powerful body that can last a long time, work capacity is all great. But if all you have is work capacity, a big engine and a beautiful body, but no technique, you suck. Mm Mm-hmm. So and to that's, be good. And, and yeah, that's one thing where, where somebody asked me, said when I did this video about functional training, he said, yeah, but you know when, what, what you guys do with kettlebells, this is, this is something different than just bodybuilding stuff. And then I said, well, the concept now that I'm listening to you is what, me, what I could maybe grasp is the concept of functional strength. What good is it to have a strong, athletic good looking body if you can't put it to good use for example you have the strongest glutes or hamstrings ever because you talk about the acceleration the brake idea now yeah. i'm thinking about the a swing and luca kurcha from Heartstyle, uh, kettlebell Heartstyle pro he calls it strength reserves people have to tap into their strength reserves understanding where they lie and now with that brake ideology i'm thinking about because i had it with a client she learned to swing, the hand-to-hand swing. So I told her, listen, when you snap your hips and you ex- fully extend your hips, then you have to really tense your abdominals and pull your knees up, fully extend them because the power that's coming from your hands and your glutes, they have to stop because mm-hmm. if they don't, then you start bending your knees, you fall almost uh, mm-hmm. forward and your upper body leans back. So that's kind of like that brake system where your neuromuscular system has to learn that, that snap, right? While you boom where everything comes to a full stop. So, yeah. Which is why I think the kettlebell swing can be one of the greatest ways to teach a thrower how to throw, a kicker how to kick, a striker how to strike. Uh, Done correctly, a kettlebell swing can be valuable. What I see online, no one, not very many people, 
even try to do them correctly. But hey, I'm Gregory. I'm gonna have to bounce here in just a few. Yes, yes. I th yeah. Uh, one, if I asked the one last question. Do explosive exercises increase explosive performance? For example, punching power for boxers or batting power for baseball players. Doing an exercise faster. What's your take on that? Well, my experience tells me yes. And quality, quality coaching tells me yes. The problem we have is researching it to make it that people will, to, to make it sciencey. We ha but here's the problem. You have to get a dedicated baseball player to do the snatch to see if he will. But this dedicated baseball player wants to look good on the beach. So he wants to do curls and reverse curls, tricep extension, skull crush. All right. All right. That's the nice thing. We've proved in track and field since 1948 that the Olympic lifts improve performance. Right. And if you could, you want to argue it all you want. You can, you can talk about performance enhancing drugs all you want. But we've known in track and field that if you increase your clean and press, your snatch, your clean and jerk, your performance in, I, I was going to say nearly every track and field event, but you'd have to prove to me the ones that doesn't improve. So I think yes. Now, having said that, it's hard to prove, prove at the level that some people, you know, I, I, I see these pissing contests online all the time about research studies and um i got a good friend his name is lyle mcdonald and it, it, it's I, I love to watch him just pick holes in research studies uh, and that's the problem it's really hard to get good research studies because to do it i could i could care less if you turn an untrained 19 year old in six weeks into a stronger untrained 19 year old I, that means nothing every program will work it doesn't matter but if you add 1% to an elite performance, mm -hmm. so you added 1%. Mm -hmm. So wait a second. So that doesn't sound like much. 1% doesn't sound like much. Mm -hmm. mm, 1% to an elite performance. So you went from, and I'll, I'll lean in. If you improve 10%, I don't see how you did it. I, I don't know how you improve 10% with one new variable. If you got a 50 meter thrower who suddenly throws 55, Dude, I want to know what you did. And How you'll win me over. over. You'll win me over if you say, here's the technical mistake he had. And I'll be like, holy cow. Because if you have a biomechanical error, you, you know, you're yeah. giving away a lot of physics. Yeah. yeah. But if you yeah. tell me yeah. it's you went from five sets of two to five sets of three, I throw the bullshit flag. You're doing something. That's like, yeah. Yeah. You don't. And just as that's for me to understand it clearly. Yes, explosiveness does have merit in the field, according to your experience. So because the, because those guys did snatches and clean and jerks, that's the reason. And if we had a control group over 40 years that, did, that just did leg press and leg extension and both have the same athletic gift, we, then we could say, yes, you know, we have a variable well, group, but yeah, you have the you experience. Wanna... So with all your newfound income, because you're so wealthy now, uh, uh, Gregory, I'm going to ask you to fund a study, a 50 year study. <laughs> yes. You're going to go find yes. uh, 100 volunteers, uh, male, female, mixed race. No problem. Uh, they're all going to yep. be uh, mm -hmm. discus throwers mm -hmm. and uh, go ahead. Start, start on that. It's, okay. I see that. I, yeah. I always see that. Is that all? Is that all you need? <laughs> well, it'd be nice if we we also have to have dormitories yeah. and cafeteria because we need I, to make sure. Yes. No, just be, yes. hold on. I'm, I'm, don't worry. I'm spending your money for you. Don't thank me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because if you're telling me that we're just going to control the weight, yeah, load, it's impossible. But you're not going to control yeah. control for income level, mm. uh, nutrition, foods, sleep. yes, sleep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, then we're, I got to raise my hand. This one group got massages, but these guys didn't. Okay, we got to fix that. Everybody, uh, we're going to have to have a, a ice baths, massages. Everything has to be built in over this. Exactly. And we're just going to study it. Let's. I'll give you a break because that's going to be a lot of money. Just four years. All right. That's so now we're at, nah, I look at. I'm looking at about $30, $35 million. I don't know what <laughs> yes. that is. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll give it a shot. 
ask okay, my wealthy you. friends, my wealthy personal training friends who, who, who yes, are willing yeah, to, all, to fund the, the study. Coaches. All the uh, all the <laughs> get them on one batch and then we'll yeah. do it. Yes, but so well, that's you, great. What, what I like about our, it, 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 even though we're kind of joking, it is the absolute truth, isn't it? Because yeah. unless you want to do that, head to head it, how are you going to find out? So my group gets to do the clean. Uh, we're just going to do the three exercises, clean and press, snatch, clean and jerk. And then you guys will do the nine machines and we'll see you in four years. And still, you know, as on a final note, even on the study, we just talked about LeBron James oh. and he does, he does the stupidest thing ever in the weight room. No, 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 no offense. But what I see what this guy does in the weight room, this is not what gets him to what, what makes him who he is. And, if he would do the the right stuff, so to speak, maybe it would peak his performance about five percent. But he's so in a league of his own that then it's such a pleasure, man. Absolutely, uh, and we could actually when such you meet the gifted athletes that just dominate your sport, the first thing you usually do is like, well, no, I can't win. They they just. We, we talked for years. Uh, my my friend, my good one of my athletes and good friend Paul Northway. He he met this person who I knew, and at this thing, the a former East German showed up, and here's a strange thing. This person, this great American discus thrower, towers over me. When this East German showed up, he towered over the person who towered over me. A giant. And and yet he was fluid, mobile strong with beautiful technique guy's gonna win man you're done you're, you're done you can only have you can only lose at so many things at quality <laughs> before you lose you know yes gregory an absolute delight let's do it again then hey you w whenever you're ready i think if if you want to we could make it a a, a regular series on our youtube I channel love it so thank you for watching if you enjoyed the video like it consider subscribing if you want to see more kettlebell content and if you're looking for a program that builds you up as a beginner to an advanced kettlebell trainee, and maybe you also look for some solid nutrition coaching, some basic stuff to help you get in shape and maybe lose weight, then check out 90 Days of Kettlebells. You'll find the link in the description, and we have a 14-day free trial included.